Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 4. Favorite part of the Bible, one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Spend some time here, if you don't mind. Um, I was going to wait till a little bit later this morning, but I'll probably just say it now and say it again later. I'm going to need my hanky. I know that before we get started. Uh, now that was an E. Um, so I'll probably be taking the week off this week. Um, I just feel like I'm under a lot of stress. Um, not for any particular reason. Um, it may be just more physical and psychological more than anything. Um, as far as blessings go, I don't think we've ever had it better. Um, the things that God has blessed our church with, the victory we won in Kenya. But, you know, I draw from some biblical examples. Um, Number one, I lax to take time for myself. Uh, Christ did. Uh, that's an example. Um, after Elijah won the showdown between him and the prophets of Baal, uh, what did he do? He ran off, ran hid in a cave, and he said, Lord, it is... It is done. Now please take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He begged God to just let him die. And um, that happens. And as long as God is blessing uh, our church, and as long as we are doing what we're doing, uh, all of us from time to time are going to get hit with things like this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go through the church. It's going to affect more than just one person. But uh, in this case, it's affecting me, and I know it. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, it's a challenge to be here this morning. So, but I'm going to do my best. I've asked God, and I've had worse times than this, trust me. Um, but I've asked God to always bless my best efforts and to bless my worst ones. And uh, God has always come through. So I ask uh, your prayers for me. Um, I am. I'm going to spend it, I'm going to spend my time at home this week. Good morning. Good morning. It's too cold for you. All right, tough guy. All right. <clears throat> Bless your heart. You encouraged me today. You did. So anyway, I assure you, I am going to take, I'm, I am not coming here this week. I'm going to spend the time at home. I've got a couple little projects at home I'm going to work on and uh, just try to recharge my batteries a little bit. Uh, I have an appointment with my doctor Wednesday, so just pray for me and uh, I think everything will be okay. I like talking about the body. Revelation chapter 4 is a good place to do that. I want to back up just a little bit uh, and show you something. Uh, you got your Bible open to Revelation 4. Uh, by the way, I am, I am doing a... Um, I see on this slide here on the screen, Modern Translation, someone was sitting on it. I'm working on a new uh, presentation I've uh, been invited to speak again down in Pea Ridge, Arkansas this month. Uh, and that's on my mind too. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of work to put this together. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't know it, but you've heard me talk about the 27th edition of the Nesselalond Greek text. And that when we get into the 28th edition, it'll be different. Well, the 28th edition came out a few years ago. 
and I missed it. And uh, again, on, on the board, on the translating committee, or on the, it's not a translation, on the Greek New Testament committee is a member of the Roman Pontifical Bible Society. Another, I don't know if he's a Jesuit, but another Catholic plant so that, and, they, and they're doing that so as to try to make the Bible as ecumenical as possible. They did that to the Swahili Bible back several years ago. And um, the Catholics got in on it, got involved in it, and they started using the corrupted texts. And that's what trailer went down. So what I'm doing is I am... I am taking key verses. I'm, I'm targeting Bible memorization. Who in here has memorized at least one verse out of the Bible? Raise your hand. Okay? And that's because we've all used one Bible. And I have seen this coming for a while. Um, currently, if you go to blueletterbible.org... There are two versions of the New American Standard Bible that you can peruse through. The New American Standard 1995 edition, the New American Standard Bible 2020 edition, with COVID virus included. And uh, that was a joke. And um, you don't have to laugh. It wasn't supposed to be that funny. But anyway, um, when I compare just those two translations against each other, they are different. They don't agree with each other. Okay? You have whole verses where they have changed the verses just between the New American Standard 1995 and the New American Standard of 2020. And that's because you have a revision of the Greek text. Again, 28th revision of the Nesalalan Greek text. And they're working on Revision 29 already. Another change to the Bible. And every time they change the New Testament, by nature, what has to happen to the Bible translations that derive from that Greek text? They, of necessity, must also change their wording. But you know what's funny? Joshua, and I'm not giving a whole lot of credit to the uh, Bible Society for this, but they are more accepting now of Textus Receptus readings than they ever have been. It's like they said, well, maybe that TR wasn't so bad, which is what the King James is based on. So anyway, that's what I thought was funny that they're having to go back now and say, well, the Textus Receptus wasn't all that bad. It was, we think it was right in significant places. So anyway, I am not by any means saying that the Bible translation issue is getting better. It is getting worse because of so many changes. You have five editions of the NIV, and they all disagree with each other. Two editions of the New American Standard, they all disagree with each other. So how can you memorize Bible verses? How can, you, how can you expect children in a Sunday school class or a Bible study class or a children's church to memorize scripture that by the time they're teenagers will be changed again? And it won't be the same when they read the Bible that they get when they're 20 years old or when they graduate high school. So anyway... Uh, Revelation 4, 2, I was immediately, and immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And I used this picture of the Ark of the Covenant and how that it had the two cherubs or the two, the, the cherubim, two of them, with their wings spread over the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant being the throne of God. And uh, Joshua, this may have been even one of your things where... You saw the heart as being the throne of God and the two lungs as being the wings of the cherub that, that covered the throne of God. And that's what, especially your left lung, 
has a big gap in it to make way for the space for the heart to fill in. So I, I absolutely see a correspondence here. Uh, but then, let's see, we talked last week about this, uh, the number of candlesticks and the decorations on there. There's seven candlesticks, the number of decorations being 66, 39 from the middle going one way, 27 on the last three pipes. That's exactly, it's exactly how the Bible is, is cut up. Exactly how the Bible is, how the Bible is arranged. You, can't, you couldn't get any better than that. And that happened. This was decorated. This was made by Moses. Uh, what are you talking about? Some 1,500 years before Christ came. And afterwards, you've got at least, mm, I'd say, 100, 200 years before um, the real church began to throw out books that should never have been in the Bible, and they ended up with 66. 27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old Testament. They rejected the Apocrypha outright, said it wasn't to be part of the Bible, was not quoted by Paul or Christ or any of the other uh, disciples, and so they didn't use it. 66 books in the Bible, 66 decorations on that lamp. And that gives us the Old and New Testament. Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. The entrance of thy words. By the way, where is the word at now? I will hide its words. Yeah, in, where? In our hearts, okay? And see, in Revelation 4, 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And I'm going to have to pull out my phone for this one before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind uh, so last week I brought these verses up to show you that uh, the, the guy I talked about him on a Pastor Mike online episode here a while back he is a uh, big time five point reformed Calvinist who, had, who made a podcast with the shock title of, If You Ask Jesus Into Your Heart, You're Not Saved. Which is baloney. It's baloney. It's theological baloney. And other things. But that's to say that as a Christian, Christ does not dwell in our hearts is unscriptural. It may comply with what John Calvin said and thought, but it does not comply with what the Bible clearly says. Second Corinthians, who has sealed us, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our heart. And I believe the heart is the container of the soul. Or the connection to the soul and the spirit. Second Corinthians 3, 3. For as much as you're manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not, with, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So what I'm going to do here is come totally un unprepared. But if you have a search thing on your phone for a Bible, for King James, let's look through, let's say from Romans on, about what the Bible says about our hearts. Okay? Just to show you. that I wouldn't, I wouldn't nitpick the Bible. I'm not just going to pick out what I like and throw out what I want, what I don't want. Anybody can study this now that we have... We can carry the Word of God searchable in our hands everywhere we go. So let's start in Romans. Uh, how about Romans 1.21? Their foolish heart was darkened. Not their mind. Not their brain. Their heart. They, what is it that makes the real, true, serious decisions in your life? 
Joshua, what made you decide to marry your wife? Was it your brain? It was your heart. Okay? Because after we get, it's after we get married, we go, what was I thinking? I don't remember. But it's our hearts, amen? That's why Jesus is not ashamed of us. He thinks with his heart. Romans 1.24 through the lust of their own hearts. Romans 2, 5, but after thy hardness, an impenitent heart. The heart doesn't repent. And if the heart doesn't repent, the mouth isn't going to repent either. Even if it says, I'm sorry, it's not going to repent. You can go into a hundred Catholic confessionals and ask for forgiveness, but not be sorry about your sins. Uh, Romans 2, 15, which showed the work of the law written in their hearts. The work of the law was written in their hearts. Now, how can it be written in your heart? Um, Romans 2.29, He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit. See, that's why I say, I think the heart is the container, or the, at least the connection, to the spirit and the soul of man. Romans 5.5, 5, And hope, hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How do we know that God loves us? Is it a head knowledge or is it a heart knowledge? It's a heart knowledge. God tells us that. And we believe it from the heart. Uh, but thank be to God. Romans six seventeen, That you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Your heart obeyed the doctrine. Uh, Romans 8, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Look at that. Romans 9, 2, I, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans, turn to Romans 10. Turn to Romans 10. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All those verses. And we'll, we'll stop there, but that just gives you the, the tip of the iceberg of what the human heart does. It's not, just the, it's not just the muscle that pumps blood. It is something far greater and far deeper than that. So Romans 10, let's start in verse 6. Uh... But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise or speaketh this way, is what that means. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Uh, let's stop for a minute. Isaiah fourteen twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down from the ground which this week in the nations? For thou hast said, and how did, what, how did God say it? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He said that in his heart. And his heart is ruling. Okay? And this, this is what makes the difference between a true born-again Christian and a person playing religion is they can perform religious acts, religious duties, religious service. I told Joshua I had to go put on my religious, my clergy robes this morning. Jacket and tie. Um... We can play religious games, but not have a change in our heart. We can do that. So he said then in verse 7, verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Where is the word? It's in your heart. And it's been there. It's been there forever. It was written in you. You knew that lying was wrong. When you first started lying, you knew that stealing was wrong. 
Your parents did not write you a copy of the Ten Commandments, put them on the refrigerator and say, don't do these. Okay? You knew that stealing from mom and dad was wrong. Lindsay knew that stealing Alicia's candy was wrong. We got her on tape doing it. When they were little. And he said, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart he believeth unto righteousness, confession is made unto God. For with the heart man believeth. For the scripture saith, Whosoever shall believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Um, but it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. Now, uh, and I'll read, finish reading what's on the screen. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. How did he do that? It's the light of the gospel, the word of God. To give light of the knowledge and glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let the God of peace rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. So our heart is where the throne is. Now, this is an, a recent article. 2020, a new 3D map illuminates the little brain within the heart. Take a look at that. They know now that the human heart has at least 40,000 brain cells in it, neurons. Neurons are the cells in your brain that transmit electrical light impulses that somehow, some way, produce the thoughts, um, controls the language, controls the motor skills, controls every part of your, of your living being. Your brain fires all these proton, or neur what did I say, neurons. All of these neuron, or these neurotic cells, I have neurotic cells, all of these neuron cells in your brain firing off electrical impulses one to another, discharging signals, and those are the basis of our thoughts. But then it goes deeper than that. It goes to our heart, which has the same type of cells that our brain does. Now I was, uh, some of you remember when I was tackling the flat earth issue. People were believing, Lynn, that the earth was flat. And making videos. And believe it or not, hosting fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar conferences around the globe. Flat Earth conferences. It's a global global event. But with all these quote unquote crackpot proofs that the earth was flat, it had a hard shell over it like like we were in a snow globe, like we feel like we are today. And there was no thing as satellites because there is no th such thing as outer space. That the firmament of the heaven is just a hard, thick shell. And one guy believes that NASA projects the moon up on the shell for us. One of their leaders, he was asked, what do you think the moon is? My personal opinion is I think it's a NASA projection. They were seeing the moon, never mind. So nothing about it made sense. And somebody I know that I was fairly close to, I was told, believed in that. So I questioned him. Sure enough, he did. He fell right into it. And this guy was no dummy. This guy was no dummy. Okay, he had a master's degree. He was a smart guy. 
And I, that bothered me. And I said, God, I, what makes somebody just go off the deep end like that? With, with everything in the world telling you that it's not true. That you believe that the earth is flat with no evidence whatsoever. And the answer that, that I got back from the scripture was, he believes it in his heart, not his mind. See, if somebody can tell you something, and you believe it in your brain, somebody else can tell you something else, and you might end up believing something different. When God puts something in your heart, it's there. For instance, take Israel. The Jews right now have a stumbling block, a stone of stumbling in their hearts. And that stone of stumbling is Jesus Christ. And they will not believe that he's the Messiah. They will not believe it. God for right now is not really allowing them to. It's not time yet. Not their time yet. But I believe it will be one of these days. I believe it will be soon but I believe it will be one of these days. And God then will remove the stone that was rolled in front of their heart to cause them to not believe to then they will believe and they'll believe it from their heart. They'll know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And you won't be able to take it away from them. Now, in spite of everything that I hear on the internet, in books that I've read, classes that I've sat in, and everything else in the world where they're trying to tell me that man evolved from absolutely nothing to where we are now over the process of 100 million years or so, I don't believe it. I'm never going to believe it. You're never going to convince me that God didn't create the earth in six days somewhere around 6,000 years ago. You will never convince me of anything else other than that. And they can say, well, we have carbon dating. Well, we have these stratas in the dirt that we know that this was from this age, we know this was from this age, and dinosaur bones were found here, Human bones were found up here. That tells us they were separated by millions of years. I still don't believe that. I still don't believe it. I believe exactly what the Bible says. It's in my heart. And I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what they call me. I don't care how they mock me. They mocked Jesus. They mock us. They call us ignorant and unlearned. But we are, in fact, wiser than they ever will be because they believe in the foolishness of this world and call it wisdom. But we believe in the wisdom of God that can only reside inside the heart of those who want to believe. Can I hear God's people say amen? But there's the proof right there. Science catches up with what the Bible says. And we find out that the Bible wasn't just giving us a metaphor by saying that God resides in our hearts or that the Word resides in our hearts. There's the conclusive evidence right there that even the physical heart has the capability of thinking exactly the way the human brain does. I wasn't done with Sunday school, by the way. He has a sea of glass around it called the pericardium. It's a sack of water that surrounds the heart. It's what, when you got hit, it's what protected your heart from smashing in and doing damage to your heart was that cushion of water around, around your heart. It was like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. When they pierced Jesus in the side, what came from his side? Blood and water issued forth. 
And I believe that they pierced him probably here or somewhere right in here and poked into that pericardium and that sac. We know physiologically, we know, Josh, you can throw something in here if you know anything about it, about what crucifixion does to the human body. But you're suffocating for what was he on the cross? Some nine hours? You're suffocating for nine hours. It's like you're drowning for nine hours. And your, your heart is being suffocated by that pericardium, which is swelling with water. Your lungs are filling up with fluids. Could you say it any better than that? That makes my day then. Uh... Josh knows the human body. He studied it. He knows the operations of it. And he's given me some good things. I appreciate him. But there's our heart, just like what John saw up in heaven. The throne surrounded by a sea of glass, clear as crystal. The, the four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Those are the four chambers of the heart that operate the heart. Man, oh man. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing, your help, Father, sustaining me today. Pray, Lord, you'd bless this church, bless all those, Lord, who are joined with us online. We thank you, Father, Lord, that uh, you have given us this blessing, the technology that we have. We pray, Lord, we use it for your glory and your kingdom always. Bless your word as it's taught this morning. Bless and help your people and give us encouragement today. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.